Ina koto katoa uh, no airani no wiwi no enarani hoki okutupuna uh, kon noho mai ratu e te whenua nei mo na whakatipuna ranga e whetu. Ka au tamokupona o rātou mā e mehi ana ki a koutou, uh, e whānau mai au e tamaki makaurau, uh, kai reira toku kainga, uh, kai Magdurond toku ingoa, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, good evening, everybody. Lovely to see some of your faces and see many recognisable names. Uh, I'm Meg Durand. Um, my ancestors come from uh, England, from France and from Ireland. Uh, and I'm their descendant of eight generations that greets you this evening. Um, I hail from Auckland. Uh, and it's lovely to be able to talk to you today about some really, really exciting work that we're looking forward to having you as part of, and that for many of you, you have already been a really crucial part of. Um, just before we get started, uh, I'd just love to do a really quick karakia for us, uh, and then we can start our hui this evening. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E he a ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south, let the breeze blow over the land. Let the breeze blow over the ocean. Let the red tipped dawn come with a sharpened air, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. Uh, I really love that karakia because uh, it always makes me think of uh, the power of nature, but also the power of Amnesty International. And it's certainly a bit of a windy, cold evening here in Tamaki Makoto. Uh, so, the work that we are looking to talk more in depth about today uh, is actually something that for many of you, uh, especially some of the names I can see there, um, probably Hamish and Dorothy and Imogen, um, certainly those of you who have been with us for a long time, Joanne, uh, you will have heard about over a number of years because it's actually been many years in the making. Uh, and it's um, a, a new program of work that we've actually worked with you to develop. So some of you might remember all the way back in 2017, uh, we were lucky enough to apply for and get a grant for um, pro bono work to look at what we could contribute to the human rights uh, space in New Zealand. So we knew that there were multiple areas in New Zealand of human rights abuses that people really wanted our time and attention on, but that it just wasn't possible for us to do uh, everything or to be all things to all people. Uh, so we were lucky enough to get uh, 120 hours for an organisation called uh, Allen and Clark to do pro bono research uh, over a period of about four months into what you, our, our volunteers and advocates and supporters thought, and also what human rights experts thought might be an area we could work on in New Zealand and make significant impact and change. So many of you would have taken part in a survey that was sent out, or you might have even been part of focus groups. Uh, and through that process, we had experts telling us loud and clear that they really saw the space of criminal justice and of people in detention as being a space where there weren't enough heavy hitters. So whilst there were smaller groups that were working hard in this area, that really there wasn't a big organisation with, I guess, the name recognition and reputation of someone like Amnesty leading the way or perhaps supporting others to lead the way. And that although there were reports that had come out from organisations like the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission was not a campaigning organisation and so wasn't necessarily able to see through to the change that needed to happen in this space. It also was an area where uh, you, our, our advocates, said that you thought was really important as well. 
So you saw people in detention as being a space that Amnesty International had traditionally been in since um, the beginning of of our work all the way back in the 1960s, uh, and that it wasn't always a popular place to be. So talking about people who are in prison can sometimes be difficult. It's not as uh, easy as fluffy kittens, uh, and certainly uh, it can get... Uh, quite negative and difficult uh, publicity and narratives um, in the public. So this was also an area that that you told us thought was really that you thought was really important and that needed work in New Zealand and that you saw Amnesty having a role to play. So jumping forward a little bit, uh, after we did that piece of of research, uh, we applied for and got um, a grant from an organisation called the J.R. McKenzie Trust. And they specialise in providing grants to organisations who are doing work on marginalised communities in New Zealand uh, and who are doing work to literally make New Zealand a more just and equal place. So again, we applied uh, and we were one of of many organisations that apply and again, we were lucky enough uh, to receive a grant and the pitch that we put to them is not only did we want to work in this space over a three to five year period, but that we wanted to do something else incredibly important and that was develop our own domestic research. So you know Amnesty uh, and you know that incredibly crucial to our work is that evidential basis. So we need to know that we have verified what we are saying uh, and usually that we have verified it for ourselves Uh, and our uh, threshold is relatively high for evidence. So uh, New Zealand hasn't had our own research program before because in order to set one up you need a long-term commitment, (laughs) you need resources and you need researchers who are trained in Amnesty's methodology. So myself and our lead researcher, who's also on the call tonight, Annalise Johnston, uh, before COVID hit, thankfully, touch wood, uh, were able to travel internationally and be part of the Amnesty Research Training Program with other researchers from around the world. Uh, So that was back in 2019. And it's meant that we've been able to establish our own process in New Zealand uh, where we can do our own investigations into human rights abuses uh, and publish our own uh, reports, which are verified and also signed off through our global movement. So it's an incredibly important and exciting time for our work here in New Zealand. As well as that, uh, we've developed our new five-year strategy, which comes into play over the next five-year period of time, and will link up with our new global strategy that will be in place until 2030. And so for us, the rights of people in detention are going to be a core focus for us over the next five-year period. And we see two really core things that we want to be able to do with that work. So one is we want to be able to identify, investigate, highlight and demonstrate abuses of vulnerable people in detention. So we think that's crucial as part of the problem definition for our systems in New Zealand. So Amnesty obviously doesn't only have um, a focus on problems, but in order to generate the kind of urgency for change, we see that investigation is really, really important. And then the second part of our work is to mobilize people to see the change that we want to see. Because as you know, uh, Amnesty's model is a collective model of people power. Uh, We see people as the center of our theory of change. So rather than focusing just on the elites, just on politicians, for instance, we actually believe that we need to mobilize enough people to change behaviors and attitudes and ultimately ensure that the people in power feel compelled to act. So for us, it's a really big piece of work to not only provide the evidence and documentation of the wrongs that we want to change, but then obviously to work together uh, with our staff team and our volunteer and advocate team uh, to ensure that we're getting our narrative out there and urging other people to join us to build a movement strong enough to ensure that the changes in policy Uh, in legislation and in behaviours occur. 
As part of that, we also see narrative change as really, really important. So uh, one of the really big things that we know is a block to changing issues in the space of detention, and in particular criminal detention facilities, is the narrative around people in prisons as being unworthy of human rights, uh, as being less than other humans, uh, and as, I guess, being inherently bad. Uh, and it's a narrative that's incredibly powerful and that we've seen not only in New Zealand, but around the world being used to justify increasingly punitive policies uh, in the justice space uh, and the criminal detention space. So in New Zealand, we've seen things like the street, three strikes law. We've seen things like double bunking. Uh, and the narrative around that has literally to be uh, to laugh at the harm caused to people who are affected by those policies uh, and to basically argue that uh, it's justified because they are people who have committed crime. So what's incredibly important to us is to not only campaign to change laws, but to also humanise, because ultimately amnesty is about standing with humanity, and we do take on the most difficult of cases, the most difficult of subject matters, uh, as you all know with our work on the death penalty over the decades, that we're not afraid to take on the issues that other people shy away from. So part of our role will also be talking about things like uh, the people who are in there, who have children, who have families, who like Mahi Bassett, a uh, case I'll talk about in a moment, uh, was desperate to reconnect with her family during COVID lockdown and couldn't because she was basically in solitary confinement, uh, who was a young woman who was brutalised herself before she went into prison uh, and lost touch with family connections and love in the way that many people have without realising how lucky they are. So for us, part of our role is to make sure that people and their stories are at the center of the work that we do. So we see this playing out over the next three to five years in really crucial ways. And one of those is working collectively with a range of other amazing people and organizations that work in this space. And as Margie mentioned at the start, hopefully you've seen some of that work happening already. So for us uh, from about probably April of last year, um, we heard really alarming reports through connections that we have uh, that people were being locked down in prison for uh, really long periods of time. And so through a network of journalists, uh, other organisations, academics, we mobilised and you came with us over a period of a year to ensure that some of these really concerning dehumanising practices were highlighted, not only in the media, uh, but through other channels as well, including direct to decision makers. So we were able uh, a week and a half ago now uh, to have a meeting with the Minister Calvin Davis, uh, partly as a result of the amazing work that many of you did uh, in ensuring that we had a large number of voices with us. So we, uh, as part of a collective, it was us as the lead uh, with Just Speak, the criminal justice organisation, uh, Professor Tracy McIntosh, uh, former MP Chester Burrows, uh, and human rights lawyer Amanda Hill, uh, requested a meeting with the minister. Uh, and we took with us the 5,000, at that stage, 300 voices that had signed our petition uh, to take your voices to Calvin Davis. So that was specifically around uh, the case of Mahi Bassett, Karma Cripps, uh, Tarina McClutchie and other women who were subject to really horrific dehumanizing practices, many of which I think people would be absolutely shocked to hear were occurring in New Zealand. I think we like to pride ourselves um, on our human rights respecting reputation, but actually the reality is there are things going on in New Zealand that a lot of people wouldn't like to know about and don't like to admit. Uh, so we had a couple of requests, urgent requests for the minister around banning uh, two of these dehumanizing practices. One was the cell buster extractions, where they literally were putting hoses under the door of a very small cell uh, and pumping four to five canisters uh, of pepper spray. 
uh, into the cells uh, so that the women were hiding under blankets, sticking their heads in the toilet bowls in order to be able to breathe, uh, and then dragging them out of their cells after a 30 to, to sometimes 45 minutes in that space. So we were calling for the immediate end of that practice. Uh, and for the end of the dehumanising feeding practices. As you probably now know, the Minister has agreed that those feeding practices will end, uh, but he certainly seemed pretty reticent on anything else. So we were absolutely overwhelmed to see three days later um, a formal apology from corrections to the woman concerned that was delivered in person, uh, and then on the Monday of last week, a Crown apology, which is just unheard of uh, really in this space. Uh, in the letter to corrections that the minister sent, he actually quoted Professor Tracy McIntosh uh, from our meeting with him the week before. So we know there was a direct link from the work that we had done as Amnesty International uh, and as a collective to the outcome, although we weren't obviously the only people involved. So I think for us, that's a really powerful first example of how we can start to have impact together in this space. So what I want to tell you about now tonight, and you are the first group except for our board uh, who heard about it in more detail over the weekend at our board meeting, is our first investigative report that will be with us in May. Um, I'm incredibly excited to share this report with you. It's a piece of work that I'm really, really proud of uh, and that actually uh, has gone to the global movement for our approvals process. And we know they think it's incredibly powerful and they are also um, really interested to see the impact it will have from their perspective. They think it will make waves not only here in New Zealand, but globally. So this looks at a vulnerable group, and we are wanting to look at a number of vulnerable groups across the period of time that we do this work. We've identified asylum seekers, uh, women, uh, pregnant women in particular, and children as particularly vulnerable groups that are subject to seclusion and restraint practices in New Zealand that we believe is dehumanizing, and in some cases could amount to torture. Uh, we think there have been multiple abuses in this space that we have a role to highlight. So the first vulnerable group that we have conducted research on is asylum seekers in our criminal detention facilities. So people who have come to New Zealand seeking protection from persecution or war who have basically been put in jail. So this research will land in May, uh, and it's over 150 hours of work that's gone into this. So myself and Annalise interviewed uh, 14 asylum seekers uh, last year. Uh, thankfully, COVID played ball, and we were able to interview in person towards the end of last year. Um, but since 2015, New Zealand's put 86 people seeking asylum in criminal detention facilities. Uh, so this has been, um, I guess, a situation that many would like to think would never happen in New Zealand, and certainly we hold ourselves up as better than Australia. But what we've documented is people who have fled to New Zealand from countries uh, like Sri Lanka, uh, like China, countries with severe records of human rights abuses uh, who have come to New Zealand seeking protection. And as you know, that is a right that we all have to seek protection or asylum in another country. Uh, they have been interviewed. They have been transferred to a prison uh, or to a police cell, I should say, held in that cell or in a prison from around four days two up to three years. So the cases that we have documented are a small segment of the 86 that we know have endured this treatment over the last five years. Uh, and from our um, research, the abuses that they have suffered include uh, mental trauma, uh, physical trauma, uh, in one extreme case, sexual assault, uh, and a range of infringements on their access to justice. So what we are dealing with is a system where the law is out of step with international uh, requirements and where the practice is out of step with our international obligations. 
Uh, so one case in particular that some of you may have actually seen land in your mailboxes uh, was the case of Carlos. So Carlos sought asylum in New Zealand after fleeing gang violence in South America. Uh, Carlos was put in prison where he was double bunked, which is the reality for most people who enter into our criminal justice system. Most people who go into prison these days are double bunked. Uh, and despite the fact that the minister is working hard to reduce those numbers, it's still a large part of people's experience in prison. And what we've discovered is that asylum seekers aren't kept separate from those who are in prison on criminal charges. Uh, so as a result, Carlos was double bunked and assaulted in his cell, suffering a fracture to his um, arm. He suffered uh, mental anguish. And it wasn't until Amnesty International intervened in his case at the start of 2020 that he was actually released from prison. So he spent three years of his life in prison trying to claim asylum. And eventually he was granted asylum towards the end of 2020 uh, after he had been released and was able to properly gather the evidence he need, needed to make his asylum claim. Uh, so the evidence that we have collected, we believe, is incredibly shocking. Uh, and indeed, Carlos is only one of those cases. Another case, uh, Lee uh, Yuan, he fled from China. Uh, and uh, although we can't tell you what he suffered in China, because we have to be incredibly careful not to release information that could identify him, I'm sure you can imagine, given what we know uh, of the things that many people flee China for. When he came to New Zealand, his fear of authorities was incredibly high, uh, and he had virtually, well, he had no English. He claimed asylum at the border as soon as he could find somebody who he was able to communicate with. Um, and despite having a valid passport and a valid visa, he was still transferred to a police cell, which terrified him because his association with the police was not a positive one. Uh, and he was then put in prison. So these cases are ones where we sat and listened uh, to people fleeing the types of things that we are campaigning against the types of things that we would assume that they would be safe from when coming to New Zealand. And actually, as many of them told us, their experience left them aghast at what they thought was a human rights respecting country. So we're sharing this information with you because we are going to need all of your help and support to work over the next year at least to make some serious changes for people who are seeking asylum in New Zealand. This has been a space that we've known about for a long time. So uh, ever since I joined Amnesty back in 2015, uh, we have worked on this behind the scenes. But prior to this, we didn't have the resource to dedicate the kind to, of time to it that we are now. It's something that all of our team cares about um, and wants to stop happening. Uh, and we've worked really closely with the Asylum Seeker Support Trust to ensure that these stories can be told and that these changes can be made. So over the next few months, we will be sharing that research work and then asking for direct changes both to legislation and to practice in policy within not only immigration, uh, but also the correction space as well. So this obviously links the issues that we care about around refugees and asylum seekers, people that are seeking safety in New Zealand, with the issues that we've already started to highlight in our criminal justice system and our places of detention. So, that is what we are starting on. Obviously, it won't be the end for us, but we see it as the first space that we want to investigate and change together. Uh, and we believe that there may also be, in some cases, a case of arbitrary detention uh, to answer. So it will be quite powerful work for us to be presenting in New Zealand. 
So I guess I would like to open it up uh, to any questions that you may have uh, or any comments that you may have on the work that's ahead of us and how we might be working with our advocates, with you, uh, to make changes in New Zealand. And just to let you know, there are many ways to ask a question. You can type it in the chat or you can uh, go, go to the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and um, raise your hand or um, wave your hand if you would prefer to do that and we'll hopefully spot you and call you in. Joanne, you just have to unmute your microphone there, Joanne. Yeah, my question was really about um, uh, these things happening, which I think are shocking and, and haven't haven't been uh, getting a lot of um, publicity. Do you think uh, that, and this is just a sort of factual question, not a political question, do you think that the shift from a national government to a Labor government has made any difference, or do you think that the the actual practice and the legislation is still facilitating this kind of treatment? Yeah, great question. Uh, I guess broadly, uh, as far as criminal justice goes, uh, I do think the Hokairangi strategy, which has come in uh, under the Labor government with Calvin Davis at the head, uh, is a strategy that focuses on humanising people in prisons. And certainly the minister has said he disagrees with things like double bunking, mm -hmm. uh, and that his aim is to reduce the prison population. Those are obviously really uh, important and noble aims. Uh, it is the implementation of those aims that we are very concerned about. And you may have even seen today the pressure that the minister is under from uh, within corrections. So prison officers today uh, had come out saying they wanted to have a vote of no confidence in the minister because of his prioritisation of the rights of people in prisons, supposedly over the rights of guards. Um, I think we did see under the previous national administration a focus on policies that were harmful to human rights. So Judith Collins, when she was minister, did bring in double bunking uh, and indeed made jokes about people being raped in prison um, when they were double bunked. Um, there were obviously changes to remand policies, uh, the, the three strikes and you're out <laughs> law that ensured prison populations increased. Uh, so yes, I think there is a slight change, but as far as the actual asylum seeker issue goes, um, this is something that's existed for a long time and is within our current Immigration Act. So there are issues within the Immigration Act that need to change that are not related to either Labour or National. And indeed, when we met with then Minister Ian Lees Galloway at the start of 2020, uh, pre-COVID again, uh, to raise the issue of asylum seekers being kept in criminal justice facilities. Uh, he didn't seem particularly perturbed. Um, it seemed the information that he was getting was lacking, uh, but his approach to it was the numbers weren't large. Uh, and I think he was actually shocked when we uh, let him know what the numbers actually were uh, and some of the experiences of those people in detention. So certainly the Labour government um, has known that these practices are, are going on and so far there's been no movement to change the realities for asylum seekers. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. Thank you and we're getting lots of questions on the chat so Dorothy in Dunedin has asked and possibly Meg if there's some staff member better tasked to answer feel free just to uh, name them in, but Dorothy from Dunedin has said, do we have any idea how many people are refused asylum in New Zealand each year? 
Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, Annalise, but I think um, on average there's around 400 people a year that claim asylum. The numbers have actually increased a little bit in the last little while, but overall we're declining. Uh, and around about 130 approximately, I think, of those are granted asylum. So quite a large proportion of them are declined. Um, those numbers are, are, are correct, Annalise? Yeah, kind of around about that number. Um, it does slightly increase on appeal, so people can be declined the first time, and so about 30% tend to be accepted the first time round, um, but then people can appeal to the Immigration and Protection Tribunal, and there's a further success rate um, on that as well. So it can change from year to year, but it, it can sit around the 40% like approximately but that's pretty broad and the reason why that's really important in relation to our research uh, is what we repeatedly found is if you put people who have arrived in a country that they know no one um, into a prison system where they don't speak the language or have suffered torture or trauma uh, they don't have the phone numbers of lawyers to call. Uh, they can't remember um, how to contact or have the phone numbers to contact the people they need to, to collect their documentation. And so one of the cases we dealt with had been declined asylum um, a number of times whilst they were in prison. Um, but whilst, once they were released from prison, they were able to do the work needed to collect the information to be able to properly make their asylum claim and they were subsequently granted asylum. So people are actually being denied justice because uh, being in prison is a massive impediment to an asylum claim. And just to add to that as well, Meg, um, I think it's worth noting too that in terms of the international human rights standards that apply to New Zealand in terms of what we've signed up to, um, immigration detention and using prison is not actually what we're meant to be doing whether someone's an asylum seeker or whether someone um, is a migrant. Um, so I think it's, it's about the use of prison and detention um, more broadly too. Yeah, and I see Jason's actually asked that question. So yes, absolutely, Jason. Mm. Um, as Annalise says, the core basis of, of our call will be that criminal detention facilities have to immediately um, be, be ceased as, as a um, space for people to be held. Um, Question okay. from Imogen. Are asylum seekers also transferred to the refugee centre in Rangarei? Uh, so a, a number of them are, um, but it has been used very sparingly and there seems to be some uh, potential bias in the people that they transfer versus those they don't. Uh, it hasn't been used in the way that we think it should be being used. And then Mira has also asked, how can we as members of Amnesty be able to help and raise awareness on this moving forward? So that might be one to throw to either you or Lisa. Possibly, can I start, Lisa, as I'm unmuted and you uh, come over the top if I don't get it right? <laughs> um, Meg said at the very beginning that this campaign was about changing the narrative. So we know just like we did with the refugee and asylum seeker campaign that has kept us pretty busy for the last five or so years. Um, we needed to upskill ourselves with uh, um, the rights of asylum seekers, for instance, um, and then learn how to take knowledge of those rights and how they were being breached here in New Zealand um, out to our community, starting with our friends and family, but then stepping up to engage in that conversation with um, decision makers, um, the wider community to ensure that we could build support for our campaigns, that kind of thing. So a big part of, of how you can help is initially to upskill yourself. Uh, we have a dedicated training program in and around this campaign. Um, um, but awareness of the rights of people in detention and particularly the rights of asylum seekers as well will be key. We are the rights-based organisation, we are the justice-based organisation. We have to highlight very compellingly, and we've got great stories to tell. We've got to become the storytellers of those people whose rights have been breached. So that, that you can help us in that way. Um, we, we do have dedicated training um, sessions that we can invite you to. 
Um, and as part of this campaign, there will be a roadshow that is launched in, at our annual hui in Christchurch on the 28th, sorry, 29th and 30th of May. And then we do plan to go around the country to meet people just like you uh, to ensure that you are upskilled and ready to tackle the decision makers and everybody else on this issue. Lisa, can you add anything more to that? I think you've covered it, Maggie. Um, just as Maggie said, it's about really um, what's going to be critical is raising that awareness through any networks, whether or not that's personal, with your, um, within your regional groups, and um, not just awareness of the issue, but also awareness of the solutions. And as Maggie said, we will be providing you with things that can give you ideas for about how you might do that and equip you with stories and so forth to help put that message out. Now, I see there's a question there from Heather. So, um, Heather, I'm assuming, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the criteria for releasing asylum seekers from prison. Uh, so, asylum seekers are held in prison on a 28-day warrant of commitment. So, because they haven't committed a crime, uh, the only way that they have authority to hold them is through what's called a warrant of a commitment, which every 28 days has to be renewed before a judge. So the case I talked about before, Carlos, who was in prison for over three years, literally was taken handcuffed in a prison van to court every 28 days to appear before a judge and a duty solicitor, or once they get a refugee lawyer, their refugee lawyer appears before the judge and immigration gives reasons for why they should hold this person in prison. So those reasons can be varied. It can be related to um, immigration can say they don't know, they're trying to identify who this person is. They're trying to work out what their identity is. They could say that they've got fears the person may abscond, um, all sorts of, of different justifications that they use. Uh, and so the arguments for not holding them in prison uh, can be that um, it's arbitrary, uh, that uh, it's unsafe so that they are um, at risk of harm in prison. Uh, and it's really just up to the judge on the day whether they get released or not. Um, and Immigration New Zealand um, sometimes will relent on particular cases. Uh, but we have documented one case in particular where immigration still continue to hold the person in prison despite them suffering a really extreme assault uh, in prison. So um, in some cases, they get released because we've pressed from the inside. So the case of Carlos, uh, there was direct advocacy there to Immigration New Zealand um, with their lawyer uh, that our team was part of. That meant that immigration relented and agreed for them to be released into the community. Um, and so that's the process is it's a, a mix of uh, Immigration New Zealand, our court system, and just the, the luck of the draw who they have legally representing them. One of the issues that we've highlighted is that there are very few refugee lawyers in New Zealand. They're very overworked and stretched. And most people going before a judge are dealing with duty solicitors who know very little about refugee law, if anything, uh, and judges who also probably know very little about refugee law. Uh, and indeed, we had one judge uh, that we highlight in the report that said something incredibly concerning that indicates they, they basically don't understand what our obligations are um, under the refugee con convention. Uh, so yeah, it can be um, a myriad of different reasons why they might get released. Uh, okay, there's another question there. Would part of your desired outcome of this movement be that those asylum seekers who have been subject to dehumanizing treatment be compensated for their years lost in mental physical deterioration? I mean, that's such a great question. So um, Amnesty works very much at the, um, the level of systemic change um, and in halting abuses. So it will be the role of other people to take um, cases on behalf of, of the um, people that we've documented. Um, our aim is to ensure that this doesn't happen to anyone um, again in New Zealand. Um, there have already been cases taken on different issues. So one case that we've documented that's been publicised in the media 
uh, was a case where um, a man was imprisoned in Mount Eden prison during the Serco years. Uh, and he was involved in what you may remember as the Fight Club scandal. So uh, he was forced to fight sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, and a separate case was actually taken to court uh, and they were successful in their claim. Um, so there are options open uh, to the people that we are discussing uh, in our report, but it won't be up to us to take those, although obviously um, we will do what we can to support behind the scenes. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, if there's nothing further, um, I guess my final comments really are, um, I think, you know, part of the wonderful um, aspect of being part of Amnesty International is that we do have this amazing um, history uh, of now in this year 60 years, uh, so it's our 60th birthday this year, of working for the rights of people um, and standing with them in their fight for justice and ensuring that their rights are recognised. So this is, uh, I guess, an area um, as far as people in prisons or in places of detention that Amnesty globally is really familiar with. So we're incredibly lucky that although we're all the way down here in New Zealand, because we're part of this amazing global movement, we have access to, um, I guess, analysis and um, other countries who have faced similar experiences, uh, policy teams that are working on these issues and advocacy teams that are based in New York, based in Geneva, um, and that are thinking about issues of arbitrary detention and immigration detention across the world. So one of the, um, I guess, fascinating aspects of this is that we will be contributing to that global discourse on how you treat people that are fleeing war and persecution. And that actually it fits with the work that you've all probably been part of over the last three to five years, demanding that New Zealand does more uh, for people who are fleeing. So it really is an issue that resonates not only in New Zealand, but obviously throughout the amnesty movement. So someone had asked, I understand, had emailed in whether or not globally people would be taking action on this. And this absolutely will be offered up to the global movement as something that they can join us in taking action on. On. So that will be part of a discussion that we will have with our regional team and our global team, um, but certainly in the same way that you've recently been taking action on Thailand um, or that you've been taking action for so many years on people who are in uh, Greek refugee camps, um, we will be asking uh, the 10 million people who are um, active around the world to join us uh, in raising these issues. So uh, I think that's something that's um, really, really heartening to know is that not only uh, does our global movement give us the ability to take action and support people internationally, um, but we will soon have that ability to ask for their support too. And I think given what a lot of people think about New Zealand, they will be shocked and horrified and will be as keen as we are to make sure this practice isn't happening. And uh, now there's just one last question there. Sorry, I don't want to miss that. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, Jason. So uh, we know uh, from many of the cases that we've looked at uh, that people who are going into prison uh, do have histories of trauma, obviously, uh, quite serious trauma, and this hasn't been taken into account. And once they're in the criminal um, detention system, they are treated exactly the same as anybody else. So most people that they come into contact with would have no idea that they are an asylum seeker. Um, so certainly their ability to have that trauma addressed uh, uh, is basically non-existent because they are being held with remand prisoners. They don't have any access to any of the courses um, that people who are in other parts of the prison would have access to. Uh, and often their ability to get the help they need is severely impacted by language barriers and by fear. Um, so yes, that's definitely something that we address in our report is that there is an extra level of care needed with this population that is not being taken in, um, in these cases. 
Okay, well, that's all from me. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. And thank you so much for all your contributions to this work so far. Um, as I say, almost four and a half years in the making of getting us here. Um, but having seen uh, the most recent draft of the report, I'm really excited about the quality of work that we've been able to create and also the potential that we have to contribute to the space in New Zealand going forward. I think it will only... Um, ensure that we have a, a more, uh, I guess, powerful and to be feared movement here in New Zealand. I think decision makers um, should be concerned because certainly there are areas of our um, criminal justice facility and border detention facility that have gone um, unnoticed for some time. So I'll hand back to Margie for anything final and um, I look forward to talking to you all over the coming year and to seeing some of the amazing actions that we can take together. Namahi nui. Thanks Meg. And friends, pretty much that's the session. Um, it is being recorded and one of the ways that you can help amplify our calls and our concerns is to share the video, which I will share with you, not just with your teams, but with your friends and family. Um, we are, after all, the grave human rights abuse organisation. And as Meg has highlighted, we are deeply concerned to have to look into New Zealand and see those grave human rights abuses occurring. And we are fit for the fight and we do plan to address those grave human rights abuses. So, um, Thank you for your time. Um, we'll make sure that you are kept informed about the campaign, future trainings, um, and if any of you are based in the South Island and would like to join our annual Hui and Skillshare, um, you'd be very welcome to be part of that training and other trainings that I'll let you all know about. Um, again, my thanks to Meg. Um, we are well led here and um, well researched, courtesy of the great work that Annalise and Meg have done. So. Um, thanks for your support and backing the great team and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Take care and have a great night all. Kakite.